As a seasoned traveler, I have been to many cities in Europe. I mean, look at my travel map. I have been to a lot of European cities. And yet, I always struggle to answer this one simple question. What is my favorite city in Europe? A lot of people would be able to answer you in less than three seconds. But for me, I always struggle to find the perfect balance between ancient history and 21st century modernity, rich culture and worldwide tolerance, quality life and cheap price tags, relaxing lifestyle and bustling markets. Many cities I have been to come very close, but none of them could top the list until I visited Budapest. The capital of Hungary may not be on the list of everyone's top three European cities to visit, but I genuinely believe it is the best city in Europe. While I'm trying to show you what Budapest is like, I aim to answer one single question. Why did I fall in love with Budapest? And of course, you cannot come to Budapest without St. Stephen's Basilica right there. Right? It's uh, one of the most famous buildings uh, in the entire city and pr probably in the entire Central Europe. Look at this, this is gigantic. I cannot even fit it in the frame. And here's a crazy thing, right? It's named after St. Stephen's. Uh, it is actually the first king of Hungary and uh, he was the one who brought Christianity to the nation. He is very, very important, right? So uh, when this church that looks like very, very old was finished in 1904, okay? Barely a hundred years ago, he was a like, and then bury the inside right because uh, it's named after him and he is extremely important but guess who else is buried inside there are only two people that have ever been buried inside this basilica it's a very famous Hungarian soccer player <laughs> in the 50s so for them you know it's like the only two important thing God and soccer Uncle Carl used to be a typical 1920s police officer here in the old banking district and if you do anything wrong, he'll bonk you on the hand with his sword and then drag you out of the district and his payment is goulash usually or some other local Hungarian cuisine and uh, people ask me if Hungarian cuisine is uh, healthy or not just look at Uncle Carl and you're gonna see that, you know he eats this every day, so yeah I say that's pretty healthy Oh, right behind me on that side is the Freedom Square and uh, yeah this is um, a very controversial figure to say the least uh, because uh, on it it says uh, to the victims of the German occupation and down here you can see the actual uh, German eagle come in and sweeping in to take away the crown jewels of uh, Hungary here's the thing it looks very ancient right but it was actually put here overnight in 2014 and the authorities did that overnight without any prior warnings or celebrations it's because that they knew this thing is gonna be controversial because it's just a lie right that Hungary has never been occupied by the German forces whether it's in World War One or World War Two because um, they're actually an ally to Hitler Shh. Yeah, but um, th that's that's the problem, right? They are trying to whitewash the history to say that, oh yeah, we were on the right side. Yeah, that's why, you know, you can see the barbed wire in front of uh, this street because uh, all of the Jewish people, they are not exactly the happiest because uh, the Hungarians were more than happy to help the Nazi Germany uh, round up all of the gypsies and Jews and execute them on the riverbank of Danube. And uh, yeah, the, so they decided to put the pebbles and um, testimonials and all of the proof of that it actually happened here under Hungarian authority. They put pebbles because they last longer than flowers. And uh, you can see that it's just a never ending, you know, hundreds of these. So this is where they executed them on the, on the riverbank. They wake them up when it's like 2 a.m. and then, you know, they are told to bring all their belongings, but it's all just a lie. Yeah, they would just tie them together and ask to be taken, uh, their shoes to be taken off. And yeah, and uh, that's when, you know, they shoot every fourth or fifth person. So the weight of their dead body will make sure nobody survives. And then someone with a big stick will tie them up together. So 60, 100 of them together and then push them into the river. It was January, middle of January. But you can see down here, it actually has rocks. So they will actually break their legs, break their bags, the dead body of bodies will drag them all the way down there so there's no evidence to be found. The statue was erected uh, more than 10 years ago, 60 pairs of shoes, less than one quarter of how many people are executed every day. 
uh, during the three month period when the Germans are losing in 1944. They call it the Red Danube, the section of it for a reason. Oh yeah, on this side is the memorial to the Soviet soldiers who have lost their lives uh, defending or, you know, uh, liberating uh, the city of Budapest. But yeah, they kind of forgot the part about leaving after liberating. So yeah, it's quite a controversial monument. And what made it even more controversial was that, you know, in 1956, uh, a few university students from nearby universities, they were just like, wait a minute, we're supposed to be free after World War II, right? Like, it's all supposed to be like a back to normal life, but why are those communists still around? And why can't we just have free press? So they decided to hijack a radio tower and then start like uh, telling everyone, you know, we need to have rights, we need to actually liberate ourselves, blah, blah, blah. And let's meet right here in front of this um, uh, monument. And then, you know, it started with 100 and then 200 and 300 and it became an all out rebellion when the Soviets decided to shoot a bullet from the top of the parliament into the crowd. Well, that turned into the famous uh, Hungarian Revolution and uh, yeah, they were quickly crushed when they sent uh, 1,200 tanks into the city. So I'm now right in front of the parliament of the Republic of Hungary. And as you can see, it is absolutely gorgeous. It's gigantic. It's in fact the third largest parliament in the entire world. First place is Australia, but we, we don't talk about Australia on this channel here. And here, actually, you can see the first version of this building. And then the second version, even bigger. And now the third version, the biggest. And uh, you can actually see in front of the door of the first one that all of the black dots mark the places the Soviet soldiers shot those student protesters in 1956. This building is so large in front of me that it actually has 10 kilometers of stairs. Here's the ironic part, right? Because it's so big, it's not actually that useful. Yeah, so now this building right behind me, uh, it's mostly a tourist attraction because uh, the parliament doesn't sit themselves here if they have a debate they have it over the river in the president's house now you can actually take a tour inside for 20 30 euros and that's basically the purpose of the entire building After a quick lunch, I decided to explore the other side of the river. But before that, I had to cross it. And here in Budapest, even the bridges have a lot of history to tell. I'm now right here on Liberty Bridge. You can see those two eagles up there? Yeah, symbols of liberty. And up there, Liberty or Liberty. So yeah, uh, I don't know if you can see it. Let's try it. There we go. You see there? Lady of Liberty. Yeah, don't, don't mind the tourists over there, you know? Um, mind this tourist over here. Yeah, so actually this bridge is built as like a, one of the last connections between the Buddha side and the Pest side because there are not many bridges that used to span the entire river. So back in the days, if you want to cross the river during the summer, there will be a wooden bridge that is just about there, down there. But during the winter, the entire river freezes, right? So the ice will come down the river and they will destroy the bridge. Every year it needs to be rebuilt. But in the winter, if you want to cross into the Buddha side or the Pest side, you simply cannot. The only way is to go upstream for more than 400 kilometers where it's shallow enough where you can cross on foot or by horse. So it's not very practical when you have a city basically segregated in the winter. So Chain Bridge, nowadays a very touristy area, is basically built as the first bridge that connects the both sides. And this is one of the last because it slowly started from Chain Bridge and then over there, uh, the white bridge you see over there. And now this one, and then you can see that one is still being built. Across 
the river, this church built into the caves of the porous mountains here in Budapest attracted my attention. It is a cave church built by the Pauline Order monks, and they have been here for hundreds of years. Inside is a series of naturally air-conditioned tunnels that connect to large rooms that are decked out with every single thing you can imagine in a normal church. And they even have a set of a precious set of wood carving furniture surviving from the 1800s. Afterwards, I continued on the roads up the rolling hills of Buda side and eventually reached the most popular destination for all tourists here in Budapest, the castle district. And the flight of stairs later, I'm finally at the heart of the castle district. Look at this. This is Matthias church. What a gorgeous building. My god. And here, uh, it's the fisherman's bastion. You can see each tower here represents one of the pagan tribes that eventually formed to become Hungary. There's uh, seven of them in total. Look at the roof tiles, my god. Yeah, it's a gothic building and uh, wow. Yeah, even the windows are already illuminated. And you must be wondering, why is it called Fisherman's Bastion, not like a blacksmith's bastion or, you know, professional memer's bastion? Well, that is because these fishermen are usually um, the people who wake up the earliest. They usually wake up way before 6 a.m. And they are usually the first one to see the sign of an attack. So this entire bastion is built in their favor. And uh, you can see that they are just, you know, uh, fishermen gearing for war. And I really hope that you liked my adventure so far here in Budapest in Hungary. And if you did, please consider clicking the like button beneath me and subscribe to my channel. It really helps me out. And let's continue with the journey, yeah? After spending nearly three hours just walking up and down the hills because I was just this mesmerized by the beauty of the city, I suddenly realized that I have not even visited the Buddha castle proper, which is now a converted museum overlooking the Danube River. And now with this footage in front of you, the question I raised in the beginning of this video becomes really easy to answer. Oh, do I like Budapest? Well, Look at the view. With views like this, who cannot like for the past?
before I continue my adventure, I had to refuel in this local Hungarian canteen, serving fresh, locally made Hungarian food with a humble price tag to boot. For less than $15, I got some cabbage, a schnitzel, some potatoes, and a goulash soup. And I knew I was in the right place when the menu has no English version available and everyone was eating standing up. Oh, right down there in this hole is actually uh, one of the labyrinths underneath the entire console complex. Uh, this entire area of Buddha is actually built on top of a series of uh, tunnels as well as caves. During the reign of the King Matthias, he actually had Dracula in prison down there. More better known locally in Transylvania as the Vlad the Impaler. And uh, nowadays, uh, it's an even worse imprisonment for everyone else. It's a shitty tourist trap. And hey, this is the house of Houdini. Yes, actually the Houdini, the one that you know. His uh, family house is actually situated right here on the Buddha Hill, uh, where all of the rich people live. So when Houdini was dying, he told his brother that, you know, um, I'm dying, but I'm a magician. I need to keep all of my secrets. I'm gonna ask you to burn everything I have. Well, guess what his brother did? Instead of burning everything, he sold everything, you know, each piece for millions of dollars for profit. You know, just typical capitalistic stuff. And yeah, so now his house is turned into another tourist trap where the only magic that it's gonna perform is on your wallet and bank account. I'm right in front of the central market. Look at this. Oh, yeah, it's still functioning today. And look at the tiles on the top. The geometric patterns. Yeah, let's go inside and check it out. Sausage. Oh my god. This is the length of like a minibus. It's insane. Look at all kinds of sausages they have. Half of the market is just meat. Oh my god. Just meat, 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 meat. Souvenir is meat. I'm not surprised that if they use lard to brush their teeth in the morning. And here you have palinka. The local basically moonshine, right? And then here the translation is fruit brandy. Well, my personal translation is more like, um, how do I say this? Uh, a sucker punch to the face. underground is where the true locals come and buy their groceries. This is where you find fish, wild game meat, and most importantly, some really, really happy pickled vegetables. And I had to double back to the canteen I visited for the dinner last time because I just couldn't resist all kinds of freshly grilled meat along with authentic Hungarian sausages. And of course, the nice friendly price tag did not hurt either. And of course, I have to pick everything again. I just can't decide. So I got everything. So some vegetables aside, and then some kind of pasta. It looks pretty nice actually. And then a grilled pork, like a local pork. This is really good. So I just got it. And then some kind of sausage. One winner later. For the afternoon, I decided to walk around the famous old Jewish quarter of Budapest. Not only to show you the tragic history that took place here more than 50 years ago, but also to contrast it with the Budapest that you have seen so that you can see how much they have improved and how friendly the Hungarian people are nowadays. And there is no better way to start with a general introduction of the Jewish history here in the city. You see across the road is the old Jewish district. Back in the days before the First World War, 
Jewish citizens basically comprise nearly one third of the Hungarian population. They are probably the third or the second largest Jewish population in entire Europe. And then Hungary kind of decided to go on a very nice uh, streak of losing wars. Suddenly, they lose 70% of their land. So imagine a dude called Adolf Hitler popped up into the middle of nowhere and told the leader of Hungary, uh, which was basically a Navy uh, officer in a country that has no sea. Just say, hey, like, do you want to get some sea, you know? Do you want to be a real Navy officer? Like, um, I can help you, you know? If you just join me and we win the Second World War, we will basically get back every land that you have lost before. So for this leader, he would just say, oh yeah, of course, I want to join you. Oh, there's a little stipulation that I have to basically strip away every single right uh, of my Jewish citizen. No problem. And well, we all know that did not end up very well, but during most of the war, actually, the Jewish citizens of Hungary were not actually persecuted well, with death. They still got stripped with most of their rights and uh, they were subhuman in basically every single way. But they were not like, sent to death camps in Germany or others. There were no death camps here in Hungary until the end of the war. When Germans decided, you know what, we got to come and occupy you guys. You guys are not doing it right. So they came over and then seven months, they executed 400,000 Jews by sending them into Auschwitz and other areas so that the local Hungarian Nazis executed the rest 200,000. Only 100,000 Jews managed to survive. So yeah, the Hungarian Holocaust was also called the most efficient Holocaust because they managed to kill 600,000 Jews in a short span of basically seven months, which was pretty impressive in a very sickly way. And right behind me is the Grand Synagogue, right? The main synagogue of the town. And it is probably home of one of the most famous Jews out there, uh, Theodor Herzl. I don't know if you heard of it. He was basically the founder of the idea of Israel. He's a, he's a perfectionist of uh, modern Zionism. They decided to make this tiny statue for him. And here you see the winter synagogue. Yeah, you can see the grand synagogue was way too big to be heated up in the winter. So they were very smart and set up this small one that only has 120 seats instead of the grand synagogue's 3,000. And down here is the Weeping Willow Memorial, used to commemorate all of those who have perished in the Hungarian Holocaust. And here in Budapest, a city full of love and hope, even these tragic past can be turned into a hopeful future and blossom into a place full of Hungarian charm and bliss. Well, I'm now in one of those uh, classic uh, brick ruin bars. You can see these are all constructed in the late 1800s, all bricks. And they were basically hastily abandoned after the Second World War because a lot of these ethnic minorities were cleansed by the Nazi Germany and the Nazi Hungary. It left abandoned in ruins for basically dozens of years until the late 1990s when the younger folks, they just say, hey, like this is a great place for us to gather and we can talk about things that our parents do not like. And then turned into these bars that just have raves or basically discussions about fringe topics uh, in these ruins and thus it turned into a ruin bar and you can see these days uh, these kind of ruin bar still holds that kind of style but it's a little bit more gentrified yeah everyone can tag and draw and that uh, you can basically create your own history here Oh yeah, and then you know, <laughs> nights out, you gotta have Palenka, you know? Hey guys! Akashi! We did it before and I don't remember what we said. Oh yeah, made from pear. Oh, nice, nice. Oh yeah, this is good stuff. Since I love Hungarian food so much, there is no way I can end the day without some proper goulash soup. Well, now I'm finally at dinner place. This is the famous goulash soup from Ghetto Goulash, one of the most popular and most uh, approachable Hungarian restaurant out there. Oh, everyone's so nice to me. And look at this goulash soup. This looks like divine. Okay, so this is uh, recommended by the server. It's, I think it's veal. And this is a special Hungarian roll, the cheese noodle. You can see the cheese oozing out from it. So basically what they do is basically have the flour and then roll around cheese and cut it and then they pan fry it on each side. Yeah, so this is like a very traditional Hungarian thing. You don't see it everywhere because it's really hard to make. And yeah, I'm just gonna take a bite right here. Like, eh. 
Oh yeah. Oh. Mm. So good. Thank you. After doing all of the sightseeing here in the city, I officially graduated from being a mere tourist into a true traveler. I spent more than a week here in Budapest and I managed to find some pretty interesting things, such as this full-length commuter railway that is run entirely by the children. For the sake of time and my storage device, I am not showing too much footage from my ride here on this snowy day. But you can see that the conductor was a 12 year old boy on my carriage and the line coordinator you can see back in the office is also somewhere around 4th to 5th grade. In fact, when I rode this train back and forth, every single person I interacted with were children volunteering in the positions of the local train company. This is a remnant of the Soviet era policies when they tried to foster children's interests in a lot of adult profession by allowing volunteering in actual job positions. Except in this case, they are running hunking metals going above 50 km per hour. And on this relatively rare snowy day in the capital of Hungary, on this ride that takes more than one hour to complete, it felt almost like a fairy tale. And another very important aspect of life here in Budapest is taking it to the Turkish baths. The Ottomans ruled this area for a few centuries and they brought along with them one of their best practices to settle down here in Hungary. And that is the relaxing Turkish baths that are very ubiquitous all around the country. And here in Budapest, there are four major Turkish baths, each operating on different procedures that are welcoming visitors and locals alike. This one situated a little bit outside the city center is famous for its absolutely gorgeous Roman domes. If I just show you this footage, you're probably gonna mistake it for some world-class museum situated in northern Italy. But in fact, this is just a lobby to sell tickets where you can bathe with old local men. And once you go inside, the views of this open-air bath is absolutely gorgeous. It is almost as if someone flooded one of the best museums in the entire world. And the mermaids, sea creatures, and ancient artifacts displayed on the racks just spontaneously came to life. Meanwhile, a little bit closer to the city center is this bath. Albeit a little bit smaller, it is much more modern, featuring a full-size indoor swimming pool, along with dozens upon dozens of pools, each at a slightly different temperature. And the most amazing pool is situated at the rooftop, where it affords a magnificent view over the Danube River, sitting underneath the hill that I have been climbing all these days. Natural spring water, heated by the Earth's mantle, slowly creeps up the porous rocks underneath these mountains and come out straight into these pools without any major treatment. And this is the exact moment that I fell in love with the city. It has a breathtaking cityscape that can rival some of the best metropolis in the entire world, but it also tried to stay so authentic with local themed restaurants and canteens. It has all kinds of deep history that is come to be expected in Central Europe, but it also has all of the convenience you can ever desire in any major city. Charming locals, cheap prices, majestic buildings, relaxing life, vibrant nights, and many, many more. These are supposed to be themes that contradict each other. But here in Budapest, they somehow managed to blend together into a harmonious hymn. And I hope in the past half an hour, you have realized why I love Budapest. This is not a city to admire and gawk at. This is a city that makes you a part of it. And most importantly, makes you a proud part of it.
Hope you enjoyed my adventure here in Budapest. And if you did, please consider clicking the like button on this video. And in the next part, I will embark on KLM Royal Dutch Airlines business class all the way into the tiny Caribbean island of St. Thomas, because this is the kind of travel we have here on the channel. So what are you waiting for? Click the subscribe button down there and let's go to the tropics.